So this is the section that we do when we look at TikToks because this is something that ends up happening usually the first hour of my day exists uh, with me checking what's happening on TikTok. And Sending sometimes 50,000 TikToks. No, I, I, I send them to my team, my crew, like everyone around me gets a, a TikTok sent to them. It's my love language around different things that we kind of cross over in the world about. Um, and so sometimes when I send them, um, they kind of spark a conversation. Also in our multi group, they spark a conversation. So it's a really good uh, opportunity for us to bring what we find online to you back at home, uh, as well as a little bit more about them, actually, about what we think. So what's your mm. first one? What do you have? So my first one is one around parenting and just growing up in a household with an African parent, with mm -hmm. a black parent. There's always some form of PTSD that we that we have. And I wouldn't call it PTSD traditionally, but a professional called it that. Okay, cool. I thought so we were just use, misusing therapy language, but go ahead. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's not war PTSD, but yeah. similar. What traumatized me as a kid was I used to get PTSD every time I heard my parents' keys in the front door. So I want to discuss the subtle and not so subtle ways in which our childhood environments shape us and the delicate balance of fostering healthy growth while ensuring safety in our homes. As a black woman and mother, a licensed clinical psychologist, professor, and scientist, I have seen firsthand how household dynamics can deeply influence a child's sense of freedom and security. Imagine a child who, instead of seeing their home as a sanctuary, perceives it as a space where their every move is scrutinized, where the sound of keys in the door signals the end of freedom and the start of an invisible yet palpable tension. This isn't just about strict parenting. It's about an environment that instills hypervigilance in a child, that constant state of alertness to potential criticism or the need to meet spoken and unspoken expectations. Now this scenario isn't unique, but it's particularly poignant in many black households and households of African descent where cultural and societal pressures often intertwine, creating an atmosphere where children must find it hard to just be. It's a place where doing the homework or chores isn't just about responsibility, but it's about proving proving the worthiness of leisure and enjoyment. So I wanna stop it there. Like mm. the last part was very poignant for me. Proving that leisure and enjoyment is worthy. Mm. Like you've proven like, did you do your homework? Did you watch this? Did you do your chores? Ah, now you can laugh. Because if you dare laugh, if you dare watch a, a, a animation, if you dare do go play with your friends, mm. there's no enjoyment unless yeah. you've actually done the responsibilities or proven that you can now go and enjoy yourself. Is that what actually happened laugh. to you, though? Yeah. That's wild. Like, black families are wild. And not just me. Like, I grew up like that. It's like as if mothers, black mothers went to the same school. Like, even if you're sick from school mm. and you laugh at something, mm. it's like, oh, you're laughing now, yeah? So you're not sick. So you can go to school. Mm. So it's always as if there was a constant scrutiny. And maybe it was because I was the only child. Mm. There's no one you can hide behind. Mm. What was the experience like for you? Um, do, 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 do. I, I think some of the ones that I remember is how you went up the stairs was a big deal in our <laughs> house. Um, and I, I remember, like, if you had a thing of, like, your mom snapped at you or told you something and it was perceived that you wouldn't like it, even if you didn't mind, and you went upstairs with heavy feet, you were stomping <laughs> your feet and you were disrespectful. <laughs> <laughs> that was like just so heavily normalized, and I think um, if it was if if you then did actually stamp your feet, if you actually and you knowingly did yeah. it, and you stomped up the stairs and you banged the door, yeah. my mum would meet you upstairs in less than five seconds. Like she would come and get you. Listen, mm. we had fear of consequence, mm. and I think I said it the other day with gentle parenting. It feels like there's no fear of consequence. Mm. How, what does that look like in your household today? consequence is so i think i, still I wouldn't have say to fear of consequence just that that scenario of stomping away you know closing doors um i i think it's when you verbalize it it's not necessarily just a, a you 
having a like a frustration and, and showing it when you walk away. It, it's more when you verbalize it in a disrespectful tone. But it's so funny because when I spent time with Dr. Shafali, she, it was really clear that even that is something that you have to allow them to express. And so like a, an example was like, if I say go to bed and then not, you know, one of my children is like, I don't want to go to bed, but they turn around and stomp off and walk. That's just their expression, right? Yeah. Um, and for me, because my mom made that such a thing about disrespect, I feel now disrespected. Of course, yeah. And then I feel like I want to, you know, recreate her way of challenging it, which is to go after them and be like, I beg your pardon. What do you tell yourself in that moment when, when that urge comes up? Uh, the actual language is like, it's okay, they're right. They can feel that way and they're still going to bed. The objective is to go to bed. The objective wasn't to... Um, and the way I frame bed is like rest. So it's their, it's their objective to go to rest now so they can be powerful for tomorrow. So that's how I frame it. And their rejection of that is they may not feel like going to bed, but the fact that they're doing it is the goal. Mm. And if I hunt them down every time, uh, I think it's called dissidents. Every time they show some, if I hunt them down and like crush them a little bit, I think the impact then becomes negative long term. Mm. If you've got the objective, why go further? Because you want the respect and the objective, and usually at yeah. the cost of their peace and safety. We had that, um, I think I sent one to you, that that video about, I think it was an NFL player, and he was just saying that do not tell your children, uh, do not yell at your children and then tell them to go to sleep. Because how can they sleep and rest knowing that their parents are threatening them, shouting at them, angry at them? Mm. Or don't, you know, yell at them in the morning and say, go to school and have a good day. How can I have mm. a good day knowing how you feel and then knowing that I have to come back to that? Yeah. So stop doing that. Yeah. And I think about that. And actually, often that would indirectly happen. Um, and then I found quite a lot more solace and peace inside school than I did at home mm. at a period of time. Um, and that isn't good. I can relate to that. I can relate to the peace, the peace part. Yeah, I felt like there was there was more control. There was more structure. Mm. There was more. St there was strictness, but it was within bounds of. Okay, you have thirty minutes now. It's break, yeah. so you can go have fun. I didn't earn break. It it just is break. Yeah, and it felt like when I heard that, I was like, hmm. Did I feel like I had to earn downtime, mm. leisure time, um, and just how does that show up in your in your adult life? Does like also let's start from the beginning with you because I think you mm. said it was more a stomping away the action of it. Yeah, you felt like you could just if there weren't any chores given to you, you mm. could just laze around all Saturday in your childhood. How, what did that look no, like? No, no, no. It was subconsciously knew, known that you whatever. So like my mom, my mom went out the night before. She might go to a christening and you know. Jamaican christening they start at three in the afternoon go on all the way until four in the morning with just the adults they're like a whole thing wait Chris, christening, christening as in baby the being baptized yeah yeah, yeah yeah it's a it's an all day and night affair <laughs> for sure so the, and they were really common back then they're less common now but the, those that used to happen my mom might come in at two three o'clock on a friday and wow. it's saturday morning so she might wake up at 10 if she wakes up at 10 and we're watching cartoons, cereal bowls are out, mess on the surfaces, mm. just dirt everywhere. We're in our pants, we're in our boxes. Mm. She, she would wake up and not have that. Like that's being disrupted immediately. So it was about getting up and setting the foundations of the house first or cleaning the house. And then if you had breakfast, there shouldn't be any trace of the fact that you've had breakfast. Mm. So you should have washed up by then. Um, and I, I want to be clear, this isn't like militancy. It's just the underlying expectation. Of course. And maybe one in 10, she'll be fine and she'll just come down and be like, oh, I'm so tired and da 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 and just, you know, make a cup of tea or call for a cup of tea. Mm. But if you, you couldn't sit there for the whole day and watch cartoons on a Saturday. Like, you, we had objectives. We had stuff that we had to do. Yeah. And I think I quite like that. You know, I set the same thing for my children. Like, in yeah. a, in a, when I have them for a day, not for the day, but in a day, they will wake up and I might say, you can do whatever you want till midday. But from midday, then you need to clean up and then there's food and then there's like, you've got a shower. There's, you can't just sit in that state all day. I think mm -hmm. that's unhealthy. But I do like that, that structure. I think it's really important. It's about, yeah, it's about structure and routine <coughs> more than anything, right? It's about making sure that you have obligations to fulfill throughout the day yeah. and then you can have fun. But 
I think what she's talking about is even if you have done your chores and mm. you are now bored and you're banging something on the wall yeah. or you're just making a mess, then it's like, oh, you're bored. Come, clean this or clean that. Yeah, That's look, technically I, how I grew up. I, I think the problem with that is then you don't get a chance to find out what happens when you're bored. I think as a child, when you're bored, you get to your most creative mm. um, and you come up with some great ideas mm. and you express yourself in the best ways possible um, to entertain yourself. Mm. I think that always doing is a really, it's a nightmare. Like I've been in a relationship with someone that must always do. And you're, you'd wake up, there's no in bedtime. There's no, we're just watching TV. If we're not f practically watching a film, there's no just chilling. Mm. There's always an up and prepping for tomorrow or yeah. the day after tomorrow. Oh, there'll be just some washing to do. Is that, there is time. Yeah, and I feel like that that makes everything uneasy. And so I know what the other side of that can be and it, it's not peaceful yeah. to be around. Yeah. But I understand that it, come, it comes from a place, but I just think the impact it has on the, in a real way, you know, is something that you have to figure out to evolve out of. 100%. 100%. I would love to just snap and one day evolve out of that mm. because it shows up in my in my adult life. Mm. So the example of having earned leisure. Mm. So if I ha if I spent a Saturday not doing anything, the Sunday best believe I'm going to be prepping. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. be prepping for the week. I'm going to be cleaning. I'm going to be doing laundry. I'm going to make up for the day that I just spent in bed and I didn't do anything. Mm. That's one thing. The other thing is I also trauma clean. <laughs> well, what does that mean? How do you I now trauma have, clean? So, so when I'm anxious or when I've had a fight mm. or when something's heavy on my mind, when I feel heavy, mm. I clean. I just clean and I, I do laundry and I, I keep busy. Mm. I keep busy. F I keep my hands busy to keep my mind from racing. <coughs> so You're like a patriarchal man's dream then. What? A patriarchal man's dream is to fight with his woman so she can clean the house. No, you just you just clean. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't I'm not in a state of anxiety or of you know heaviness all the time. So mm. there are days when I don't do that, but I've noticed that when I am in my hyper focus cleaning, there's usually something going on. It's either mm. I'm anxious about something or I've had an argument with someone and I'm I'm trying to think over what just happened mm. but while I'm being busy. Mm. Um but yeah, that's that's quite interesting to see how it shows up. It would have been so interesting to have a an actual expert here to give us some insight on how the brain works and how you unlearn those mm. things. What's the next one you got? Um the next one I got is something that I've typically started seeing online. I started seeing it late last year. Mm. Um mostly on South African TikTok, South African Twitter. Mm. And it's this woman um, you won't be able to see it on screen, but we're going to put it up. But all you can hear is music. And she's crying into the camera. And it says... It says the not so glamorous side of traveling alone. Mm. Right? And it's not really about traveling alone, but it's about loneliness. Mm. There's so many people are so lonely out there and they take to the internet to tell people, you you know, I'm I'm lonely. Yeah. I'm d I, and it hurts and mm. I don't have a partner and I don't have someone to travel with. Mm. Have and you been lonely before? Have you identified that to yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. What was happening for you at the yeah, time? Yeah, yeah. Look, I, as I mentioned before, I'm an only child, so being alone is not is not really a problem for me, but it's in the moments where I have people around me and I still feel alone mm. where I'm when, where I'm more conscious of feeling lonely. Um, and the loneliness for me is more around just feeling like you're the only person in the world. Mm. I think I've said that so many times. Like I, f I just feel like I'm the only person in the world and, th and no one else is there. But it's obviously a lie. It's your brain telling you that mm. because you have friends, you have people that love you, you have family. And very often... And I don't want to attribute this to my star sign, oh <laughs> but I, mm. <laughs> I'm a Scorpio. Mm. I'm a Scorpio, and we. Do you know what? I can't unhear <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson saying that it's absolute nonsense, and I can't unhear it. But continue. <laughs> sorry, it's important to you. I don't want to disrespect the, the frameworks you're using. Go the, on. Sorry. It's not that important to me, but. But you're going to use it anyway. Go on. <laughs> t tell us why the stars made you do stuff, and go on. <laughs> Can you give me a chance? Um. 
but we are generally people that that are, that love being by ourselves and we can't have shallow conversations and discussions with people mm. so very often i feel like people don't always want the heavy stuff you know people yeah. want light friends friends that can just talk about surface level stuff how's your day going oh the weather oh my god your hair what color is that where did mm. you go <laughs> and i could do that for about five minutes but i can't do it for very long mm. so the loneliness creeps in when i feel like i can't reach out to people who get the 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 depths of loneliness that i'm in mm. and won't make it heavy or try and fix it they'll yeah. just sit there and listen mm. and if there's really nothing you can do about that kind of loneliness you have to find the solace within yourself because people can't fix that for you yeah. but what i'm saying is it, it, it has become a trend that i see of women just going on the internet i find it very challenging to see someone prop up a camera and then cry and yeah. it doesn't mean that the feelings are not authentic it just means that it, it what, just what is that trend right all about? Me. Like, is, is that just like fe- feigning? Uh, maybe it's not. Maybe it's authentic. So, creating empath- uh, empathy artificially to to do what? What what happens? But that's after, my question. You know, I, I suppose the same thing is who the fuck did I marry? It's a bit of that, isn't it? Like yeah. you told that story, but you went to sixty episodes because what's the payoff for it? Mm. What's the payoff for being seen crying on your Instagram? Is it, will, it, will a man see that and be like, oh, I want that woman? Or what would True. happen? Or would other women come together and be like, I want to be your friend? I don't know. What yeah. What do you think happens? I have no idea. My question is, what kind of people will be drawn to you based off of that? Well, that's a really good question. If you if you pose as a victim, yeah. you attract predators. No? Yeah, exactly. My point. Mm. However, we have to, you know, just trust that people have agency to decide and have discernment to be like you're just here because you saw my video yeah but the thing about predators they don't come saying i'm a predator they're not they don't look like lions True. <laughs> they'll look like deer <laughs> <laughs> um, like gazelles yeah um no i i do find the so firstly on on loneliness i think that's an interesting topic like i've i've never been alone but i've always felt lonely mm. and i think that's just a, a matter of my neurodivergency just kicking in it just is a thing where my brain operates faster. And people think that's, that means that it's better. Not always necessarily. I'd like to turn it off at points. But <laughs> like, yeah, brain operates faster. I go through processes and emotions faster. So like, in the saddest moment, I can be on the other side of it in a few days, genuinely. And I think for some people, it's challenging. Like, they expect me to sit there for months and be sad about something. Yeah. And I'm not really that type of person. Um, uh, I think just delayed responses. There's loads of things I think about being neurodivergent that isolates you, especially if you're surrounded by neurotypicals, if you don't know who your people are. Mm. What's really interesting is that whenever I am challenged, when I'm around other neurodivergent people, there is a community of understanding of how to approach it, like how to be with me without doing anything. Mm. Um, And I I never forget, I think I told the story of when I was divorced and one of my closest friends, like I just moved out of the house and I was staying in a hotel. My closest friend came and sat with me for basically like five, six days. Mm. And he bought me food and he just sat there. Didn't say anything. Yeah. Didn't talk about it. Yeah. He was just being a really, a real one. And on the other side, <laughs> my neurotypical friends were like challenging the issue. Why? How? Mm. What? When? Tell me things. And you're like, mm. I get it. But like, that's probably the worst time to try and get sense. Because also I was just so devastated that I just didn't have the appropriate level of things to say mm. on the topic at the time. Mm. So it it just meant that like that I was putting energy in the world that I probably shouldn't have. Um so yeah, I think generally being alone is a a thing that occurs often, but I have a lot of acceptance around it. And actually I think it's for the best because as I said with my examples, sometimes it's just too heavy to carry the needs of a neurotypical person when you're going through something big yourself yeah um or when you're trying to achieve something you need to then communicate it to maybe sometimes people who inherently just won't understand anyway or have a lot of fear in the way that they exist and so they then inject their fear or limitations on what you're just trying to get done Mm. which is not always a great way so the most neurodivergent people i know operate independently or in tiny silos anyway Mm. Um, and they're really high achieving, but really just struggle with sometimes the social aspect of mm. interactions. So that is definitely a thing. The trend of like trying to get 
crying, s- empath- on, crying, crying online. Look, I I think the expression is really powerful because it unites people around an idea in a way that it wouldn't have. We don't discuss loneliness as a society enough. Mm. I worry that it creates this performative nature. So what's authentic in it? And to set a tripod up and then start to cry is something else than if you set a tripod up to try and do a piece of the camera and then you started talking about how you feel, you broke, Mm -hmm. and it just hit you. Mm. And even if you share that, that becomes really powerful. But because without the context, it just looks performative. Because she did look like she was genuinely crying, but it just felt like the first thing, I started getting rational before I got emotionally connected to her on that particular occasion. Yeah. And I'm an empath, so I feel like that was a, a massive disconnect. I don't really like the trend. I'd rather people find real ways to have the conversation with somebody else. I agree. Uh, what do you do when you have that cycle of loneliness? How do you break it? Uh, I don't try to break it. I think that's that's another thing that's become really important. Like, I think um, since 2020, I had some of the worst experiences as an adult since 2020. And I isolated myself um, to navigate them because I couldn't tell what was real anymore. There were so many moving parts, so many in authenticity so much challenges that if I didn't remove myself like bearing in mind it was like running a company separation into divorce changing personal relationships COVID George Floyd I was just like look I I'm I can't I have a view like I, I in real time I always had a view mm. but the view wasn't connecting to my surroundings and what people needed or expected or wanted and so I felt like that was creating more challenge and the fact that I wasn't more affected probably made it feel like it was something to challenge me on mm. um and so I just pulled away and I just spent some time with myself that's when I did my silent retreat that's when I did uh, a lot of therapy I was in the, like weekly for about 18 months which was really powerful for me because you just get to you have to get into the things mm. I think when a big institution like marriage fails fails for you you you, you can't you can't return back to that way of living. It would be so inauthentic to sit there and be like, mm. oh, I'll just do this again. Mm. And maybe if I do it with a different person, it would be like all of those things because I I don't think I did it with a bad person. I don't think I necessarily did it in a bad way. I just think it didn't work. Mm. And you need answers as to what that means for you now. Not necessarily why it didn't work because even with those answers, it's not always clear what that means. I just went into who am I now? What kind of life would I want to live now? Um, And I kind of got the answer pretty quickly, but I just wanted to, I wanted to shred everything. Mm. All the ego, the persona, the act, the, you know, who I thought I was, um, my challenges with fatherhood. I was like, I can't go to other people and talk to about fatherhood. I, I, I actually needed an answer for myself. So obviously Dope Black Dads was a question of how do I become a better dad? And I didn't have the answer when I started it. But then I spent a year and a half talking to other people about their experiences and ignoring my own. And I was like, I actually want my own answers. And then I found my answers and I had an amazing period afterwards where like parenting was the best thing. It's all I really wanted to do. Mm. And I had all these other commitments. So um, I, I, I think my way of dealing with it is, you know, to isolate. But I feel self-imposed isolation is mm. good. I feel that is something that I want to do more and I will do more. Um, and I also don't really want to, oh, I'm more retreating about the idea of sharing some of those things hmm. more than anything. And, and for the only reason of just like, I need a little piece of the universe that's mine. And I think that that's one of the areas that I would like to preserve hmm. as much as possible. I think it's quite a beautiful thing to just be by yourself, preferably in nature, which is where I did my retreat, which was amazing. Hmm. Sounds beautiful. I, f- I feel that soul searching journeys like that don't often happen for people or they don't have the luxury to do Mm. it you know especially if you're a parent you have responsibilities where does you know taking time away where does that fit in Mm. for parents who aren't co-parenting for parents who are together in one household with someone and they need that time to find answers for themselves yeah i look i think if i was to ever go back 15 years and do marriage into co-parenting again it's not that I would do it different because of the person. I would just approach the whole thing differently. Mm. I, I think the idea of, like, I you know, I got married at 28. I met that person when I was 26. I wasn't fully adulting yet. 
Like I, w- I was in like the early stages of acting out adulthood. I hadn't arrived. So much of the habits and behaviors I picked up weren't really appropriate and conducive to family, to like my own well-being, to looking after children, to being a man for another adult woman. Like it just, there's loads of things that were missing. Um, and I couldn't find them out in the throes of the thing. So, I, well, I, you know, for me now, it's fundamental that there's time apart. I, I think relationships, healthy ones, have real time apart where you go be who you are, your best self, and enjoy mm. your version of existing to come bring back to the the collective and enrich the collective. Mm. Um, I also just think, like, if you're not actively working on some of the ideas that you have of why you have them, Mm-hmm. I think you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. I think, you know, all the theory of being a man, being a woman, being married, being a dad, being a mum, are inherently flawed. Mm. Especially if you're not neurotypical. And more than that, if you are not standardized in your way of thinking. And if you've gone through really big things, a lot of those concepts won't work for you mm. out of the box. If you don't know who you are, you can't even apply new rules to the old concepts, let alone create a new one. So I I, I, I would never do that again. I would do it in a way that was befitting to who I actually am. And I think it would be much more successful. A lot of the, the I think the biggest thing that flawed, flawed as in flaw, <laughs> flawed. Um, I was, You're the Englishman. Here. No, do you know why? Because I, I said you. I had flawed like a flawed <laughs> diamond, and I then I meant flawed as in like the flawed me. I was on the floor. Oh, uh, you actually have that as a word here. Yeah. Many people don't know flawed is actually a word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Doesn't like, mean you fall though. No, it means that I I am on the floor as in I've reached my bottom. Oh, it, wow. it has a different meaning in South Africa for for coloured folk. What does it mean? Go on, tell so me. So if you floored me, you killed me, you KO'd me. I yeah, laughed so hard. I laughed so hard you floored me. Yeah, but then imagine that as in like you gave me information that was serious and it floored me. Ah. Uh, Do you know what I mean? So, so both, it's okay, kind of similar. Okay, okay. This is interesting language exchange. Mm. Um so I th- I think a lot a lot of those things brought me to an unnecessarily challenged place. And I think a lot of them could have been avoided mm. with just a bit more wisdom and experience. Mm. Um so would you say that wisdom and experience come with age? What about people who who find that they have, you know, that, that deep sense of urgency and conviction to get married at 24 and 25? I, 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 I would never advocate to interrupt somebody's vision of their marriage and children. Mm. You, you do the thing, you do it in your way. And inherently, I think we all do. I think we all look for validation for our method of what we're trying to do. Or to keep our dreams alive. Like if you want to be a mother or a father so much, you will seek validation that your way of doing it will be successful. True. And Um, there are many, many, many sources to validate. Many sources that you can go through and you will find your, you know, your master in terms of that information. So what do you have to ask yourself then? Well, I I think the first thing is is that why do you want to become a father and what do you have to offer your children? And I think anything that is material or external is probably a bad answer. If you're talking about internal, it has to be devoid of your ego. Mm. And then you also have to treat whatever you have to give as a gift. So you're not, it's not an exchange with children. You don't get, you don't get it back. (laughs) So it's not like, oh, I'm going to teach my son (laughs) to be the greatest football player of all time. And as a result, I'll get infinity tickets to Manchester. (laughs) I'll I'll manage him, become his agent and get 12% for his career. Like Mm. if you go into it with that, you will destroy your relationship with your child. So for me, I think it's a gift. And that means you have to have abundance Mm. to even give it as a gift which is the hilarious part because I spent, I think much in masculinity is as you develop capacity, you must use it to protect and provide someone, somewhere, somehow. Mm. And, you know, men have an abundance. Yeah. That's a very, like, uh, divine feminine energy. That's, for me, that's like you've preserved yourself. You mm. have created boundaries. You are practicing stillness Mm. you are connected to your body the sensations that your body has none of these things you're taught to do as men 
So we have like, oh, I've got 10% battery life. I've got to use it <laughs> to make more money. So I'm going to stay up and type out this presentation or I've got to do it to record another thing. We don't, we just deplete. And I think um, that's a massive part of why we have inequity in us and why we get so sick and why we mm. then abandon a lot of the families that we create yeah. is because we don't actually fill our own cup. Um, so yeah, I think that's a massive thing, I think. Mm. Interesting. What's the next one? Uh, the next one is a little bit long. I think it'll be our last one. Um, so this one, I'm going to play a part of it. You sent it to me. Mm. So maybe we can elaborate together after. But this one is around a man who was engaged to his partner for quite some time. Mm. Uh, she has a daughter who is getting married. Um, and the biological father has since come into the picture and he's just venting about it so mm. here it is oh wow my stepdaughter's waiting because her real daddy is the one that's gonna walk her down the aisle so let me tell you guys about my stepdaughter all right she wants her real daddy to walk her down the aisle now let me give you a little backstory on, my, on me and my stepdaughter she just graduated from university which i paid for now she went to an in-state university but it still cost me about forty thousand dollars now I also bought her a car. I bought her a car straight after high school. That way she could go back and forth to school. I bought her a car. She still lives with me and her mother. She does not have a job. Now, she's set to be married on August the 8th. And for the past six months, that's all her and her mother been talking about doing. Being occupied with, being consumed most of the time. Now, her daddy, he don't contribute to not one cent on her. Not her education. Not her, not child support, which is partly her mother's fault because, you know, she didn't fight for that. And, and that, I guess that's just what the settlement was. And he only around to make promises. I do that for you. I do this for you. And then take off. And then she'd be heartbroken. But she adores her father, right? So, like I said, she said to be married in August. And the wedding venue, I told him they could have it in my home. The wedding venue can hold about 250 people, right? Now, I said, hey. I got a list of 20 people, 20 people that I want to come to the wedding. I'm paying for this at my house. I want these 20 people to come. Do y'all know Saturday, I see one of my friends at the golf course, right? He's supposed to come to the wedding. I'm like, hey, I'm gonna see you at the wedding, right? He said, I only got an announcement. I didn't get an invite. I'm like, nah, I'll let my girlfriend and, and stepdaughter know to send out the invitations on these few people. And then you're supposed to get an invite. He said, I got something, but it was an announcement. So we walked to his car because I want to check, right? Mm. And sure enough. So I'm going to cut it short there because technically what he's saying is out of all of these arrangements, he's been mm. paying and he's he's technically been accepting and it's also not his fiance, it's his girlfriend. Mm. Accepted her as his own, taken her, taking care of her as his own. And now that the the biological father has shown up, he's going to walk her down the aisle. They, he goes further to talk about they're going to dance, do the do daddy daddy daughter dance to mm. his picked out song and they're also going to do a thing afterwards but it's as if it's secondary so mm. technically he's being pushed out also the 20 people out of the 250 guests that they are inviting mm. hadn't been invited so first things first <laughs> where do we start with the situation this man is in distress but it seems that he's he said that he's done he's mm. cut them off and no one's coming back to his house um he's done with his girlfriend of mm. I think over a decade they've been together if not more 15 years something mm. like that how do you how do you recover from that how do you as a man recover from that having spent and invested so much yeah look, uh, look our platform is called Dope Black Dads in that is the most inclusive um, broader term of dads including stepdads father-in-laws um, uh, male guardians all the things mm. Uh, it's really just about men who show up mm. for children and young people and play an active role in their lives. And this guy has done that. He, mm. he's, he has shown, you know, the truest caliber of what a great man can do. Um, what the sad part is, is that that's not being honored mm. um, by the people that he's done that with and for. And <clears throat> it's, it's sad because I think when I hear a lot of the conversations that, men are communicating is that cool we haven't been amazing mm. but there are some things that women do also which is d 
deeply damaging. Mm. Um, and like a lot of my work centers on what men need to do. And I think it appears that he had a vision where he thought he was the head of a household and a family. Mm. And he has found out that he is not. And he is a vehicle for their safety and security, but mm. he hasn't got the equity in yeah. the family. Um, that's a really hard thing to find out in context. It's a really hard thing to find out when you have a mirror of the dad who didn't do the things that you did. Mm -hmm. I think there is a safe space around like walking down the aisle. I think you can still give that up to the biological father if that's her wish. Um, because I think that's a space that holds. If he's alive and breathing and that's her choice, you can take that. I think where it gets disrespectful is where like, in his house for it, the 20 guests that he wanted to come were like removed without a conversation. That's true. And and then I think some of the other gestures of like paying for it, you know, removing, you know, not accommodating him in the, the view of like the father-daughter dance. Mm. Things, just things like coming up with different ways to do it to honor the fact that you played a role. Mm. And it just means that the relationship with the child wasn't where he thought it was. And that could have been orchestrated by the mother. That could have been orchestrated just by her. But however, I feel that there is, uh, I want to say collusion, but that feels a bit violent between the mother and the daughter to create this context. Mm. Like they've had a conversation. They both are on the same page about what this is. And it makes me sad because I think when we advocate, you know, especially as a platform that men should do more, these are the counters that we get thrown with. Mm. And so the reason why I focus on that um, because I, I put a post up on Dope Black Dad's Instagram recently about um, men and we've ruined our relationship with black women and a lot of men were frustrated with that narrative because they feel, well, what about us? And it's happened to us too. Um, and what my point is, is that I only focus on our work. Mm. I, I, I'm not interested in discussing what women need to do for men. Mm. You know, I feel there are so many great women out there who are not engaging in this dialogue and this rhetoric, who yeah. are hungry and i say hungry and desperate in the most loving way for a partner to show up and honor them in a way and make them feel safe and mm. seen and secure them and they will give everything they have for that man yeah and they're available they're just around they exist in every single space that you're in they're and friend zoned they're friend zoned <laughs> or they're not seen as the most desirable but they're the women that you build empires with right yeah. and so I think whenever a man, a man has created a life on a platform talking about women, he is disingenuous in that approach. Because if any man with a purpose and a mission would be focused on his purpose and his mission. Mm. What I've identified along my purpose and my mission is that men need grabbing on the way to whatever it is that I'm doing. Mm. I need to hold space for men as a skill set that I have and I do it. Mm. But I don't want to sit there and talk about what women are thinking, doing, and how they're behaving and how it's wrong. I think there's this like idea that men, some men, have dominion over women to the point that if they choose to move away from men and how they interact with them and create boundaries and create conversations about men, that it's their immediate responsibility to interrupt that conversation guide it into an outcome which means they are more accessible to more men mm. more often mm. i'm saying that's a losing conversation for men to get involved in because women have some women have chosen their path in terms of what they want for themselves if in 10 years time or a, you know a generation of women say they regret having this conversation i just wish i just put up with the man that we had and we just settled down and i wish i got cheated on more absolutely that's their conversation to have mm. about their regrets but it's not to say men are struggling to find partners. There's yeah. so many. So I don't know who's affected by this shift. I don't know why it's important for them to have that feeling. I do know a lot of men are hurt from the air experiences mm. and they feel they never got any justice in the relationship and they never got it from the conversations that society are having. And now it feels like there's this massive shift where men are not allowed to speak. Mm. So they feel like they need to find that justice. That's why we have male-led spaces. 
That's why you have therapy. That's why you have psychologists. That's why you have a Reiki healing team. You go get a massage. You go mm. get, you know, a facial. Whatever it is to make you feel better about you without having to lean on women, but specifically black women, to have the conversation about your feelings. Why specifically black women? Because I think that's where my care pr primary starts. That's where, that's the observations that I've made that need, that's the most urgent. That's the most important conversation. And I feel like our interactive, like obviously Adobe Bad Dads, there are partners who have white partners and partners from other cultures. Absolutely fine. This It's nothing to do with who you can love. But I, but, but black women are in our homes from our birth. Mm. And there is a relationship that has been fractured with some men and some women that that culture is now so normalized that it's everywhere. Mm. And it feels huge. And the only way we're going to get out of it is if men focus on their advancements, their ability to protect and provide honor, to be emotionally stable, to be powerful. And that creates a context. You will attract your tribe just like that. Like, I don't even want women who don't want to be around men, who don't want to be accessed by men, who feel men are bad people. Like, I just, it, it doesn't even, it doesn't matter. It's a waste of thought. I'm Sorry, not trying to convince what you, those. What do you mean with that? I, I, I'm like the the woman that they're referring to that they feel must pander to their feelings, mm -hmm. and they those women who are hurt and are communicating how they've been hurt by men mm -hmm. and how they they want a boundary with men and men shouldn't do this and you know I I can't attract that person energetically. We're not in the same space. If I want to build with someone like that, they're not in a position to build because they're in their hurt phase. And that guy's in his hurt phase. He can't mm. build if he's hurt. He can't be the anchor for you if he's yeah. in his feelings about a conversation that's happening mm. out in the world. But when I meet real women one-on-one, -on -one, I know where you are at. Mm. And, when, and those women who are amazing and ready and looking for a partner, mm. they're ready. But th 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 that's the point of it. Like They're ready because they're ready. So you know I've had this conversation before, not too long ago, around men and hurt. And how, you know, where does men's deep-rooted hurt stem from mm. that we see in an old mature man that's in his 50s and 60s and still being hurt by that 15-year-old girl who said, ew, you're ugly, or whatever the case might be. Mm. The wounding, the mother wound, we spoke about that. Yeah. Like, you said that that hurt infiltrates so deeply into our lives that we don't mm. recognize it. So does that then mean, because we all suffer from, from, from mother wounds, father mm. wounds, we suffer. But it, it seems as if men hold on to that hurt in a deep way and there's a fragility there. There's a vulnerability, not vulnerability, there's a fragility, there's a sensitivity and there's a, almost I want to say sensitiveness. Yeah, there's a mm. sensitiveness there for men when it comes to exposing their hurt. And it's almost as if they're like, no one will get past this threshold because of one person that hurt me or because of my mother wound. So wh where do we start if, if we just hurt people walking around mm. hurting other people? Well, I, I think there's so much in that question, but I think we all are hurt and we're all holding on to our things. Mm. I think the mother wound specifically to men holds more directly the father wound works much more directly to women but we also have the wound of our fathers and your mothers so it, it does work both ways but i think the mother wound is about the generational experiences that m the mother has had um, and that's direct and indirect which then goes into their parenting mm -hmm. process and decision making their partner mm -hmm. pr partner decision making and gets fed into the children. So to avoid f uh, speaking over people's heads, mm. uh, let's give a practical example what, what we would say. We're well, not therapists, but what would we say a mother wound? I, I, I would say a woman growing up with a disinterested father who is abusive to her mother and she processes that, creates meaning out of that and observations about a role of a man. Mm. And I want a man who can protect me, provide for me, um, and then that design is what she then tries to create in her own relationship. But that person then recreates what happens that with her mother. And then that child is then birthed, whether it's a boy or girl, with that hurt that she's experienced from two generations, gets plowed into them as a child. They then absorb that. And if you absorb it as a man, it's different to how you absorb it as a woman. So as a man, it could be that I don't believe women are 
are uh, are capable of providing without men or I don't think that they are stable. I think that I had to provide for my mum when I was 16. Mm. So, you know, their relationship to women is now mm. different and fractured and they don't understand how healthy masculinity should be displayed. Um, and I think the generational element of it gets passed down in such a nuanced way because as a child, more than likely you get to see your grandparents. Mm. So you get to see your grandparents' grandparents' impact on your grandparents. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And you th that then goes into your mother and that goes into you. So it's almost five generations of hurt is plowed mm. into and visible through, the vi through your grandparents into you. And you're like, actually, if we don't all individually go on a journey to break that cycle, yeah we will recreate the exact same scenarios that we've come from. Mm. I think people are still living a 1960s, 70s, 50s relationship today because they heard stories of their grandmother and then it's been passed on to their mother, then passed on to them. And they believe that that original version that was told through their grandparents is what's present today. Mm. The, the whole ga game is completely different. And so I think it's for all of us to be aware. I'll talk for myself. I needed to be aware of you know, even what I believe a strong black woman should be like and how mm. problematic that language was in my 20s. And, you know, seeing my mum do so much by herself is my vision of what a good woman now looks like. Mm. And then a, the idea of a woman not being able to do that is like, why can't you do that? My mum is the level. If you're not that level, you're not the kind of woman that I should be with. Mm. These are problematic things because I then place onto somebody an idea of what they should be, which is never attainable because my mother is my superhero. Is, and she's an individual on her own, in her own right and grew up in a different time. Um, yeah, I think uh, that for me, it's really important that we dis that we always talk about both sides, the the hurt that men have and inflict, and the hurt that women have and inflict as mm. well. Uh, and it's absolutely correct that you say we we don't give the hurt that women inflict as much attention as we do with the hurt that men inflict because mm. it's more physical. It's harmful. Yeah, you could well, die. Well, well th and this is a really important thing to, I know we need to close, but this is a really important differentiator. The reason why a woman's feelings in this regard um, takes precedent is and priority is because how men display this is through physical violence, sexual Absolutely violence, true. economic abuses. Yeah. And I think those things create a much bigger impact impact mm. as well as psychological and physical i think the the damage that women do to men is a lot more emotional and um uh mental yeah and i think then that means a lot of it is hidden but it also just means that it has doesn't have the physical component part which happens and occurs in women mm. so i think we end up focusing on the women's feelings. So we do need to focus on the men's feelings, but just not at the cost of the women's feelings and Absolutely. their experiences. 100%. Um, cool. Thank you very much. Cool session. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs>